Last week, we heard a message from our guest speaker, Don Ross, and he brought a message about two lost sons. Are you guys hearing the, the feedback? I'm working on that. That's awesome. We, two lost sons. There, were, there was a bad lost son and a good lost son. That's, that's the way it seemed in the story. The, the bad lost son was found and celebrated. So I'm kind of doing a little bit of review from last Sunday. The good lost son left us hanging. Hey, don't leave me hanging. We don't know. Did he go into the party or did he not? He, he was outside lost. And we're continuing in this series, Lost and Found. Lost and Found. So I want to invite you, if you have a Bible or if you've got your Bible on your device, would you turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5? And I, I just, I really encourage you to have God's word in your hand, one way or the other. Uh, we're going to put uh, verses up one at a time on the screen, but when you have it in your hand, you can, you can reread it, you can look at the context that I don't have time to get into today. So 2 Corinthians 5, 16 to 20, it's a great passage of scripture. I've been planning for weeks uh, for, for, to bring this message. I didn't know if for sure it would be today, but I'm, I'm glad it's today. I want to ask you a question. Have you ever been surprised by a present? Have you ever been surprised by a gift? We had a birthday party at our house, just a, a, a small family birthday party for our daughter-in-law, Taylor, this weekend. Uh, it's her birthday month. And there, uh, as, as we do, we all have a, a, a list, a, you know, a, a wish list that, that we look at and we, we shop for. And I was just thinking, as, as Taylor saw those gifts, there were two or three little gift bags that we had, and she, she knew what she had put on her list. And when she got to the biggest bag, I, I, she, she was just seemed so grateful for everything, but I just wondered if inside she was going, oh, this feels pretty light. <laughs> I, does, I don't think these feel like the boots that were on my list. <laughs> But that's okay. I know whatever my in-laws give me is going to be awesome. I'm going to love it. But I, I, I'm sure that there was probably a moment where she goes, oh, it can't be that. But then when she opened it, it, was, it wasn't that, but it was a slip of paper that said, it's on the way. <laughs> Have any of you ever done that? Have you ever shopped for something that was supposed to be here a week ago and it's still not here? It's in, in China somewhere or something. And that's, uh, that's literally where it was. Uh, and uh, I, I, I have a feeling that she was surprised because when she lifted it, it was like, oh, this is nothing. This is like a little feather or something. But it actually was a surprising gift. That gift was actually exactly what she needed, exactly what she wanted, exactly what she hoped for. It just came in a little different package than she expected. And you never know what's inside. You never know what's inside. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16. Paul is writing, and he's talking about how we look at people. And he said, so we have stopped. Somebody say stopped. We have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. In other words, we've stopped evaluating by how someone seems on the outside. He says, at one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we know him now. I have several truths, truths to bring to you this morning. The first one is this. Jesus sees hearts. Jesus sees hearts. And amen. And this is in contrast how he sees. It's in contrast to how you and I see people. We can only judge by the flesh, by the flesh and blood. We can only judge by what we see on the outside. And so it, we look at the package, and we sometimes miss what's on the inside. Think about how before we put our faith in Jesus, we looked at people and were judgy. We judge them. We, we, we think things like, that person annoys me. It's that person just gets on my nerves. Or we look at a person, we say, oh, that's a person I disagree with politically. We are not on the same page. Or that person's attractive. Or that person's unattractive. That's a person who doesn't like me. 
And so then I feel a certain way about them. Or, worst of all, that person's not trying as hard as I am to be godly. Because my ways are right. (laughs) Paul said, man, we even used to look at Jesus like that. Paul said, Paul, wow, who said, man, I just just look at Jesus like, oh, he's just some guy. But, but then Paul said, now we realize we were way off. He is the son of God. Yeah. So how does God look at people? In 1 Samuel in the Bible, 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, the Lord said to Samuel, the Lord does not see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then uh, one of Jesus' disciples, John, wrote in John 2.22, no one needed to tell him, no one needed to tell Jesus about human nature, for he knew what was, what was in each person's heart. God sees the heart. God sees what's inside the package. He doesn't stop at the outside. So Paul said because of that, and because of everything that we've learned about Jesus and everything that he's taught us, now we too strive to see what God sees in people. We're changed because we've seen the good example of Jesus. So now this is how we choose and how we strive to talk. That's a person that God loves. There's a person made in the image of God. That's how we see people now. There's a person who seems to be wandering and searching for God, just like I used to be. Jesus sees hearts. He sees hearts. When we had the family over this weekend, I was just kind of uh, um, thinking about our two granddaughters, Camilla and Kaya. And they're each at different stages, of course, because they're different ages. And Kaya is she's just a little, a little over a year, right? Just a little over a year, like a year and a half. Um, and she's walking and getting around. She's saying a few words, and really the most important word, Papa. <laughs> right here. Camilla, the older one, wrote a song, and I think she shows real promise. Because this is how her song goes. Papa is so nice. (laughs) And it's just, that's the basic gist of the whole song. That is a good song. I really like that song. So good. But at each stage, you just see them growing. And, And I was thinking back to when they were baby, when they were first born. Isn't it just amazing that a newborn baby is pretty much helpless? Like, they cannot do anything. They cannot talk. They cannot walk. But that baby has the potential to teach others to talk. That baby has the potential to run in the Olympic Games. We just can't see it quite yet. But we parents and grandparents, we can see it. We can see the potential in those little ones. And God sees the potential in you. And in others, he sees the potential. He can look beyond. He's mature enough and wise enough. He can look beyond what's going on right now to see there's more. That, that person has potential. There's a, there's a lot that I can do in them and through them. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, just going on in that same passage, uh, Paul said that we, we, we no longer look at, at Jesus even the way that we used to, looking only on the outside. And he says, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. Somebody say, new person. New person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. And that is good news. You know, we might look at the package and go, that package needs some work. That package is not doing well, or that package is, is not where I think they should be. But God looks at them, and he says, wow, if they put their faith in Jesus, if they belong to Christ, a new life has begun, period. That's the truth. In fact, the old life is gone, and we have a lot to celebrate in that person. And this just reminds me, real change is possible through the Holy Spirit. Real change is possible in your life. 
real change is possible in the lives of the people around you. Real change is possible. With God, nothing is impossible. That's what his word says. And real change is possible because of the transforming power of the Holy Spirit working in your life or working in another person's lives, and especially of those who belong to Jesus. And that's who Paul's writing about right here. And my second truth is this, Jesus changes lives. Jesus changes lives. If you have put your faith in Jesus to save you, you are a new creation. You are a new person. I think we need to all say, I am new. Could you just say that? I am new. Let's say it again. I am new. Yes. Your old life is gone. Your new life has begun. That's good news. Now, you're not yet perfect, and neither am I. And that's why we just need to kind of set aside the whole judging thing altogether. Uh, I, I, I just, I've been listening to a book uh, about this, and it's really challenging me. And this concept really, uh, really got me. Only God has the character to judge. And he even took it a step further. Only God has the character to be angry. Because our angry, we're, our anger a lot of times is a little mixed with pride, selfishness, different things, but not for God. Wow, how differently God sees us. You're not perfect yet, but God has given you a second chance. And you're in process. I'm in process. And I'm not just saying that because, oh, I'm just kind of acting or faking humility. Literally, I'm in process. And if you don't believe me, ask my wife. She could probably tell you, yes, he's in process. But I am in process. I'm not the same person I was a year ago or 20 years ago. Thank you, Jesus. It's sort of like we are caterpillars becoming butterflies. We uh, just went with our other set of grandkids to the Pacific Science Center, and they had a butterfly exhibit. I don't know if you've been there. It was really cool where you can walk in and butterflies are flying around and, and uh, floating and ne right next to you and stuff. But what really drew my attention was they had a display of all these butterflies in cocoons. And I don't know how they, how they did it if they, I don't know if they just sort of like reattached each, but they were like lines of this is all one kind of butterfly with a, a certain shaped cocoon, and then here's another line of all this other different kind of moth or whatever, all, all their cocoons. And I, I don't remember seeing this before, but there was, there was just this certain kind where they were all wiggling. Like it's just, it sort of looks like a little rock hanging from a branch in a way. It's just like a, just a little nothing. It looks like on the outside, but they were wiggling. And we could see that the caterpillars had become butterflies and they were starting to claw their ways out of that, claw, claw their way out of that cocoon. And I, I, it just reminded me how we, you're not supposed to disturb them. You're not supposed to get out the scissors and surgically get them out because they need that challenge to strengthen their wings. Even in the process, the very, very hard process, God is working for their good. He has allowed that challenge to be there for the little butterfly's sake. It seems like it would be so much more humane just to bust them out of that cocoon. Actually, it's not. It's actually much more loving to, to allow that struggle to be there long enough to strengthen them. There's a process. God is working on me. He's working on you. We're in process. And that's why we don't judge people according to the flesh, according to the outward appearance, according to the package. Because God's working on the inside, and we can't always see it. We don't know what he's doing. This is what we celebrate when we baptize people in water in just a few, a few weeks. It's a very symbolic, beautiful, cool, strange uh, ritual that Jesus told us to do when a person puts their faith in him. And the, the, the symbolism of it is that just as Jesus died for my sins and he went into the grave, I am dying to my sins and going into the water. And we're identifying with Jesus as we do that. Just as Jesus was raised to new life, we are brought up out of the water and we embrace his new life. It's so beautiful and it's all about a process. 
that God is taking us through, real change is possible for anyone. Anyone. Even that person that comes to your mind, you're going, oh, but him, oh, but her. Real change is possible because Jesus is the transformer by his Holy Spirit. In Philippians chapter 2, another part of the Bible, in verse 13, it says, For God is working in you. God is working in you. God is working in you. Giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. I was just talking with someone before service this morning. It was actually before prayer gathering. And she was just so excited and so on fire for God. She was excited about serving. And she was just excited about what God's been doing in her life. And, and there was something in her life that she just said, God, you got to help me with this desire. Please change my desire. And he did. And she was just testifying, wow, and so now I feel alive and fresh and like I'm moving forward in God. That's God working in you to give you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. That's what he does. Jesus changes lives. Have you ever had the experience of being at odds with someone? I have, trust me. <laughs> Yes, I have. Uh, meaning, like, you're not good. You and that other person, you're, you're not in a good place. Your relationship is not in a good place. So uh, it's awkward to even run into, run into that person at the store. Like, oh, no, they're here, and then we're in the same aisle. What are we going to do? Or run into them at an event that has happened to me uh, many times. I'm just out at, at, a, at a community event, and oh, wow, okay, there we are. We're serving together. That's awesome. That's great. But it feels awkward because we're at odds. But conversely, have you ever had the experience of being reconciled to a person that you were at odds with? If you are married, then hopefully you've had this experience <laughs> because I can tell you, you have been at odds <laughs> at some point. Hopefully you've also experienced being reconciled to that, that person. How do you feel when you're reconciled to someone that you were at odds with? Peaceful? Relieved? Happy? I have felt all those things. In verse 18, 2 Corinthians 5.18, Paul wrote, And all of this transformation is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. Now, I don't know if you are aware of this. The Bible was not written down initially in English. It's written down in, in two or three other languages. And in the original language here, in these next few verses, I'm going to be reading this one and a few more to come from the same passage. I think it's five or six times it has the same root word that means reconciled. And that's, that's the case right here. He didn't use the word reconciled in, in this translation in verse 18, but that's what he's saying. The God who brought us back, the God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. And that's my next truth. Jesus reconciles people. Jesus reconciles people. So what does reconciliation mean? Well, to reconcile is to bring two estranged parties together. That's what reconciling means. Two people that are at odds from, from each other or two parties that are at odds with each other coming back together. That's reconciliation. The, the word reconciliation implies and tells us that there was an offense somewhere that disrupted this relationship. But someone took a positive action to build a bridge and get over it. <laughs> Amen? Build a bridge and get over it. That is reconciliation right there. There is a gap between us and God. And that gap is caused by our sin nature and our sinful choices. And so we're at odds because of our sin. Our sin separates us from God. We are estranged from each other. But God brings us back together through Jesus, through what Jesus did. And the only way we can be reconciled to God, it's not by good works. It's not by trying hard. It is by what Jesus did for us, for you, in your place on the cross. Jesus paid for your offense, my offense. You might say, well, I've never done anything bad. We have a sin nature. <laughs> 
So no matter what, from the moment we were born, because we were born into the human race, we were separated from God by our sin nature. But Jesus paid for the offense. He made it so that we no longer have to be separated from God. We can come to God and be with God, and God can be in us and in you. In Romans chapter 5, verse 10 to 11, another place in the Bible, Paul writes, Our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. We are reconciled. Our relationship has been restored. Our relationship with God. If you have put your faith in Jesus, you are reconciled to God. And if you have not yet done that, then today's your day. I'm going to lead you in a prayer to do that very thing in just a few moments together. So guess how Jesus feels right now when you're reconciled to him? He feels peaceful. He feels relieved. He feels happy. It's not because that's how we do that I would say that. I would say we feel that way because he did first. (laughs) We have our feelings. We have our relationships all because he had them first. He's God. He's our creator. Have you ever had way more to do in your life than you could ever accomplish on your own? I have friends who have gotten multiple master's degrees while caring for their family, serving at church, having a full-time job. That feels overwhelming. That is a lot. Maybe you remember sending out wedding invitations. That's so overwhelming. Oh, how can I get all these addresses? And that? Oh, it's just overwhelming. Have you ever moved? Moving is overwhelming. It is more, if you, have, if you have more than just a piece of clothes, you cannot move on yourself. You're going to need someone to help you carry that couch or that heavy chair or whatever. It is overwhelming on your own. You, you just cannot move on your own. Have you ever laid sod in your yard? I have been conscripted to a couple of times <laughs> in, a, in a former life. It is a big job. How about taking care of, of your baby after having had a C-section? Like all these things are just overwhelming. They're things you cannot do on your own. And they illustrate something spiritual. In 2 Corinthians 5, 18 to 20, so in the middle of the verse, and God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back. In other words, be reconciled to God. Here's another truth. Jesus uses you. Jesus uses you. It's not that Jesus is overwhelmed. It's that Jesus chooses to reach everybody through his followers. He went away so that he could be in us. He was physically with those 12 disciples for, the, for those years. He was physically with them, but he couldn't be with everyone in the world at the same time. He said, I'm going to go away, send my Holy Spirit so I can be with you all the time, and then we're going to get this thing done. We're going to get the world reconciled to God. That's his goal. That's his plan. Literally, God's plan is that every person on the planet would be reconciled to God, no longer estranged, no longer separated, but now connected in Christ with Christ in them. That's the message of reconciliation. There's a God who loves you dearly and you are separated from him because of your sin and Jesus bridges the gap. That's it. That's the whole message of reconciliation. We can add some nuance to it, but you boil it down. That's the thing. And this is the the amazing thing. God has entrusted you with this message. 
if it is going to get out, if the whole world is going to be reconciled, it is up to you and me. That is how he has chosen to, do, chosen to do it. You could say he could do it another way. Yes, but he didn't choose that other way. <laughs> he chose to do it through you and me. And I love the word entrusted. He's just saying, I'm giving you this message, trusting you with this. Make sure everybody hears it. Make sure everybody knows. I love the fact that he didn't just give this message to pastors. He did not just give this message to the super Christians. You know them. I know them. They're amazing. But this message, Paul said, is to us. It is entrusted to all of us, to you and to me. So you've got some really good news to share with other people. There is real hope and renewed life in Jesus. Amen? Amen. That's good news. You are Jesus' ambassador. I looked up what an ambassador is. It's the highest ranking official of ours in another country. It's like it's the president's highest ranking, like in that country. That's it. You're the, our ambassador to that country. That's the buck stops there. And Paul said, You're all ambassadors for Jesus. Wow. So you are representing Jesus' interests on this world. What are Jesus' interests? Number one, four letter word. What do you think it is? La, 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 la. Love. Everybody, somebody say love. <laughs> Jesus is interested in love for God and love for people. That's his number one interest. But he's also interested in belonging, in forgiveness, in salvation, in healing, in deliverance. Those are Jesus' interests. And as his ambassadors, we're out representing him. Make sure that those things happen, that people get saved, healed, delivered, that people get connected. They're not alone. People get transformed. That's his interest. And we have around us a world full of people who really need those things. They may or may not be aware. Just like for years, I was not aware that, because, that the uh, symptoms I had were symptoms of dehydration. I was not aware I needed water. I would have told you, I don't need water. I'm fine. I was not aware, but I did need water. Interesting that when I started drinking water, those symptoms went away. In the same way, the people around you may say, I do not need God. I do not need what you're, what you're preaching. I do not need what you're selling. But they do. <laughs> because everybody does. There's everybody. We all were born into the sinful condition, so we all need a Savior. Every single one of us need God. And there's a world waiting to hear you in your way, bring the message of reconciliation to God. I hope that's enough to make your pulse race with excitement. Because you've been entrusted with something very precious to God. That's honoring. That's lifting. That's exciting. You're an ambassador. You're a high-ranking official in this world, in the kingdom of God. Wow, that's awesome. Ask yourself, what is it that I value about my relationship with God? Just, just take a moment. Don't say it out loud, but just ask yourself, what is it that I personally value, that you value about your relationship with God? Just think about it for a second. If you value those things, people around you will also. I value having someone I can go to when I'm in trouble, when I'm in need. People around you will also. I value uh, having um, the uh, ability to hear direction and wisdom when I don't know which way to go. People around you will appreciate wisdom also. All the things that you appreciate about your relationship with God, others will appreciate those things too. And it's not like, hey, world, I'm better than y'all because we are all sinners saved by grace. <laughs> by the grace of Jesus Christ. I found Jesus, Jesus found me, and I want Jesus to find you too. That's our attitude, <laughs> right? Amen. Some of you might be thinking, oh, I'm a bad ambassador. I'm not doing a very good job for God. I'm not representing him well. But I want you to know that you're in process. Don't be too hard on yourself. 
And even if you tried being uh, a, a message bearer, even if you tried pointing someone to Jesus and it didn't work out, try again. Because sometimes the struggle is building you up. And it's actually God being very caring in your life. He's transforming you. The bottom line is this. You are called to the ministry of reconciliation. You and I, we all are. And it's a beautiful message. It's a great honor. It's a great privilege. Would you look around you in this room? If you're in the room online, I, I don't know if you can see the, see the seats or not, but just look around. Notice that there are still a few empty seats. We have a nicely full crowd this morning, but there are still some empty seats. And every empty seat represents a person who could be sitting there, a person with a story, a person with a past, a person with victories and struggles, a person with needs, and very potentially a person who has not yet heard that Jesus loves them. we got a spot for them. And wouldn't it be cool if you're the one that Jesus would talk through to fill one of those seats with a person coming to him? Wouldn't that be awesome? We often, in prayer times, we'll pray over the seats and touch each seat. Lord, fill this with a person coming to Jesus. Wouldn't it be cool if that seat was filled because of you sharing the message of reconciliation with somebody? I am always looking to invite someone to church or to Jesus. I'm just kind of always, which one? There was a, a situation recently. I was with the grandkids in a park, and there was a couple with a couple kids there and they were just chat 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 and as they as they were going i i i, I thought do i invite them or do i not it was it was uh in bonnie lake and oh okay they'd have to drive a little bit okay but so but i i, I went ahead and i invited them immediately the temperature of the atmosphere changed and the the gal i i could just tell whoop, a wall went up and she closed off and she had been the chatty one but the husband seemed like, uh, uh, yeah, open it. Like, I'm open. Like, he, he took the card. That was one experience I had a couple weeks ago. Another, another experience uh, a week or so ago, uh, we were in a restaurant, and the server was taking care of us. And I, I, I always carry invite cards to a church in my wallet. And I just said, hey, I don't know if you have a church to go to for Easter, but we have a great one. I would love to invite you there. He goes, I'll be there. Like, just like that? Like, no more convincing? He must have felt a need for God. And someone finally invited him and gave him, like, a concrete tool. Oh, here's where I can find God. Yes, you can. You can find him there. We're going to be worshiping him. I talked to him this morning. What, what do you have to lose? Eh, not much. What do you have to gain? Someone could be sitting right there. Worshiping Jesus that didn't even know him last week. Last week, if you were in this service, and I know some were, some weren't, we, we just prayerfully filled out this card. It just says, my mission, people that I'm going to pray for, that I, I'm pretty sure have not yet given their lives to Jesus. And I have a few extras. I, I, ushers, well, I, I, we hadn't planned this, but why don't you just come down real quick and just offer them real quick. If you would like one of those cards, it's just got a bunch of blanks. Uh, for you to write the names of some people that you're praying for, uh, that they would find Jesus. All right, so real quick, Leon, if you want to just go back through. It, uh, and I encourage you to take one. It, think of someone in that category that um, you think, I think, they're, I think they're far from Jesus. Why don't we divide and conquer so we go a little, yeah, there we go. Awesome, perfect. Excellent. Let's pray for these people. Let's pray that just like you found Jesus, they will find Jesus too. Amen? Why don't you stand to your feet, would you? And if, you, if you've got your card with you, maybe you stuck it in your Bible or your purse or whatever, you could actually take it out. Let's, let's pray for them. But if not, you might remember who's there or who's on that list. 
these are people we, we care about or we interact with. We want to see them put their faith in Jesus. Would you just pray with me? Lord, I thank you so much that you have reconciled us. For those of us who put our faith in you, you have reconciled us. I thank you for our relationship. Thank you for bringing us back into relationship with you, just like the, the lost son. Thank you for giving us the ministry of reconciliation, Lord. And I just pray that you would make your appeal to us. And so, Lord, we bring these people that we've met or we've seen or that we're related to or that we work with, that we care about. Lord, we bring them to you right now. And would you just right where you are, just begin praying specifically for different names of people that you know that you suspect they, they need to have a... They need to hear about Jesus. They need to hear about his love for them, his care for them. Would you pray specifically for them? And Lord, right now, Lord, I just, I, I lift up every person uh, on the, I just my short list, Lord God. I've got some family members here. I've got some neighbors here, Lord. I've got some people I've just met in the community here. And Lord, I lift them up to you, Lord. You love them. You care about them, Lord. Help me to bring the message of reconciliation to them, Lord God. I pray that they would be no longer estranged from you, but that they would be in you and that they would come to Jesus. Lord Jesus, find them where they are. Use me, speak through me, speak through others, Lord God. Help them find Jesus. And with your head still bowed, I, I just want to give you an invitation. Perhaps you have not yet been reconciled to God. Perhaps you are, you're, you're maybe seeking God or you're interested in God or you, you came to, to this gathering today because you're interested. Maybe you're, you've come online, you're, you're, you're curious about God. I want you to know that God loves you so much that he put this whole plan I've been describing into place so that you would find out that God loves you. He's made sure that people all over the world have found Jesus and have the message of reconciliation. Why? Because he knows you. He cares about you. He wants you to be close to God. He doesn't want you to have any distance between you and God. So how do you, how, how since Jesus has made a way to have a relationship with God, how do, you, how do you do your part? How do you respond? Turn from your sin, turn your life over to Jesus, and let him lead. If you would like to do that today, to become an apprentice of Jesus, a follower of Jesus, would you just raise your hand? And if you're in the room, I'll see you, and I'll pray for you specifically online. God will see you, and I will pray for you as well. Would, would you just bow your heads with me? And I'll, church, let's just pray together and, and join those who are putting their faith in Jesus today. Would you pray after me? Jesus, I invite you into my life. I acknowledge I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sin and make me new. Start the process. I choose to follow you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And we just say welcome to the kingdom of God. Welcome to the family of God. If you put your faith in Jesus. And if, 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 whether you're online or in the room, if you have just put your faith in Jesus, we have got a course for you just to give you some next steps. It's called Following Jesus, and we'll tell you a little bit more about that. Yes. As Pastor was sharing, you know, we're all in process, and we want to come alongside you and help you in that process. And so there's a couple things you can do on that connect card you started filling out. If you would just mark on the bottom, there's a little place to, to mark to let us know that you made a decision to follow Jesus. Or if you're online, you can just uh, fill out that little uh, QR code there. And then also our following Jesus course. There's a table out in the lobby that you can stop by. We've got a book for you and there's an online course for you to go through. Uh, so I just want to invite you to, to be all that you can be in Jesus. Um, as Pastor was sharing, I was like, you know, I don't know how many of you are aware out in the lobby that we have little cards that look like this. It says, find hope, encounter God, live fulfilled. Or we have another one that says, what are you doing this Sunday? And then on the back, it tells them where our church is and what time the service is. So I reached into my purse and pulled it out so I can show you I invite you to grab some and have them on hand for those opportunities that God gives you to invite someone to come to church and find out who Jesus is. Amen?
Amen. All right. Well, we're going to get ready to head out, but there's uh, one more thing. If there are any of you that could help us set up for groups tonight, um, we have a few chairs to set up in the back and a little bit to do over here. If you could help us, we just need a few people. And then we will see you next week. But remember, set your clocks ahead an hour if you have, you know, the old clock and not your phone. Or Yeah. Okay. All right. Have a great week. God bless. Thinking that you already figured it out. This is a song about love. Another song about love. Asking yourself, haven't we heard enough? Isn't there something else that we can?